Woo! <laughs> We're live now. We are live. Let's find it. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, that's strange. Oh, you can just see us dancing. <laughs> we'll wait for people to come on. Hopefully, you catch them. They want to dance. Maybe. Join us and say hello. Love yes. to know who's on tonight. Where are we? I've got a couple. I'm going to share it. Where is it? I just shared it as well. And all it is, it keeps having you dance. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> Cool. Who we got? Ashley. Hey, guys. Ash and Christy. Hey. How is everyone? How's everyone coping? Want to hear from as many people as we can tonight. Hey, Beck, how are you doing? Nice hey, Beck. Be Congratulations on your new purchase. Been stuffed around with that house, poor Beck. Yeah, I know. So I spoke to, <clears throat> um, she spoke to my old colleague where I used to work and bought a house there. Hmm. Yeah. Power of connection. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm going to jump into it. Do we know how many people are on? Uh, it says 18. Oh. Feeling popular. <laughs> oh, <laughs> let's, rock. let's rock and roll. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to episode five of Confined by Walls, Not by Heart. For those who are joining us for the first time and not familiar with Mindful Oz, my name is Matt Runnels, and I'm very grateful for all of you who are watching this, um, continuing to show up. I guess, in your own time and find ways to live healthier, uh, build the emotional resilience and be better of uh, support to those loved ones that are around you in this difficult time. As I said, it is a di very difficult time and we're, what we're experiencing. So what better way to start tonight's show by running through some resources that we encourage here at Mindful Oz to tap into that are all available to us in the palm of our hand on our phone. Um, but before I do that, if you're experiencing crisis situations or challenges with mind and behavioural health, please remember to ring Lifeline on 13 11 14 or Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36. I also want to take this time to share these fantastic apps that I said about that we advocate for at Mindful Oz and encourage you to tap into. Given the current situation that we're in there, they're really handy to have in the palm of our hand. So the first one um, is the Resilience Project app. A lot of them a lot of you will probably be familiar with Hugh from the Resilience Project. Oh, high loads at service providers may cause performance issues. We'll see how we go. Um, the Resilience Project app. So uh, a fantastic app full of mindfulness, gratitude and empathy that work on the foundations of GEM. So that's a, it's a really good one to, that goes a long way to helping us be well and to tap into the things that are most important to us in this very situation that we're in. I also want to give a shout out to episode number two guest, Dennis Armfield and his program at Business Fight Club. Um, the 14 day isolation reboot program, which can be found on businessfightclub.co. A great program for people at home right now in isolation to better themselves with gratitude, mindfulness and a range of beneficial topics. And it's just $9.70. So a couple of cups of coffee and um, you've got yourself a really important tool for this time while we're at home. Um, we've also got my best me program. So I'm going to shamelessly plug myself right here, right now, um, a self-paced self-discovery program, uh, online from the comfort of your home for men only, sorry, ladies at the moment to work on elements of their wellbeing and health career relationships. And the most important, uh, which is balancing that with fun and our play, the stuff that refuels us. So you can find that online at www.mattarunnels.com forward slash best me. Um, and I'd love for you to join me on the journey to do that. Um, we also have the Headspace app, which is the one that I frequently use. Uh, get happy, less stress and sleep soundly thanks to your everyday guide to mindfulness in just a few practices and minutes a day. Hundreds of meditations based on everything from managing stress and anxiety to calming yourself before sleep or meditations for on the go. One more, we've got Buddhify, which I love. Uh, Buddhify is here to help you bring more calm, clarity and kindness to all parts of your life. Whether you're looking to reduce stress and anxiety or get a better night's sleep, Buddhify is easy to follow guided meditations to help you live a healthier and happier life. So just quietly, I've been tracking my own sleep over the last few months and most of you will be aware that I used to have severe sleep insomnia. 
So through holistically looking after my wellness and putting countless time in every single day, I can proudly say that I now have been able to track that I fall asleep every single night in under three minutes, thanks to gratitude, mm -hmm. empathy, mindfulness, and lots of breath work. So please use those apps and tap into what exists. Oh, where's the camera? There, right in front of you, Matt, um, <laughs> to work on yourself because it takes five minutes of your time um, and the the outcomes are just incredible. The the sleep that I'm able to get now is just I never thought was possible. Guys and girls, this stuff does work, and that's why I have lived experience advocates and professionals on these episodes to help you find the ways and means in which to practice these good habits and do wellness your well, your way, a healthy way, and most importantly, a safe way. Anywho, moving on to the person that I have joining me tonight. A special guest, I absolutely love her and her family, every single one of them. She's an amazing representation of someone who has experienced rock bottom but ch chose to use that place as the solid foundation on which she re rebuilt her life and I've personally loved watching her go about it. Having battled with chronic mental illness since late childhood, Jamie had always struggled with the want to speak up but the shame and stig stigma that came attached to having these illnesses prevented that. In the year following her near fatal suicide attempt, Janie, Jamie, sorry, Jamie, Jamie had enough of the stigma and gained enough courage to speak up about her mental illness in hope to reduce the stigma attached and show that even straight A students and happy kids could go through this brain pain and anguish. Since deciding to speak out, Jamie has become an advocate in the mental health space, striving to create awareness and show that mental illness doesn't discriminate, even if you seem to have it all going for you from the outside looking in. Jamie's dedication to speaking out and speaking up has brought her uh, across my path here at Mindful Oz and her growth has seen a Mindful Oz charity first where her journey started off from attending events to volunteering at events to speaking at events, leading our events and being our first ever employee. Jamie has since gone on to frequently uh, add to her growing, ever-growing wellness plan, seeking out and enjoying the elements of holistic wellness as well as other alternative measures. The drive to want to be better and to do better has developed into her gaining her Reiki Healing Practitioner Certificate. I'm going to stuff this name up, guaranteed. <laughs> uh, and training to be a root cause therapy practitioner through our friends at the Centre for Healing with Ryan Hassan. Jamie is the epitome, epitome of inner strength and daily shows up with a want to improve her well-being, but sharing those skill sets with everyone she can along the way, including myself. Jamie has, gone, Jamie has said previously, I want to be able to show people that mental illness doesn't discriminate, that just because people may think you are happy and you have a supportive family and great opportunities doesn't mean you don't live with a diagnosed mental illness. She, she believes that one life lost to suicide is a life too many and that if she can do something about it, which is the most important part for her. She is wholeheartedly committed to the cause, striving to make others feel comfortable enough to admit they are okay to someone else. In the current times we find ourselves in, it's important to share and celebrate the wins and the positives. So, Jamie, today is your three-year anniversary and with the yes. legend of a husband of yours, Daniel. Recently <laughs> married, so your first anniversary as a married couple, you're spending the night with me. So, yep. Daniel, suck shit. And Jamie, <laughs> he won't thank even you be so watching. much for joining us. Welcome to Episode 5, Confined by Walls, Not by Heart. Thank you. What a wrap. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can you just introduce me to everywhere that I go now? If like I once, reading is yeah, a little bit if, difficult. I stuck a few bits and pieces of that up. No, not at all. It might take me a while to get into places if you're going to spend three or four minutes actually introducing me. But, wow, way to pump girl stars up. I think it's important. I mean, I, I've said on previous episodes, I go on podcasts all the time, and what I dislike about most of the ones that I do go on, and yeah. I'm brutally honest, is the fact that I have to sit there and tell my story the whole time. We know that telling our story in this space is um, can be quite triggering or traumatic sometimes. So yeah. to have to sit there on every single podcast or interview and retell it um, is not necessary. I'd rather do that for you. Um, yeah. Of course, we'll talk on, touch on bits and pieces of it tonight. But um, I would rather, and you're also not going to praise yourself, whereas I'm happy to, to praise you for all the things that you do. You are an absolute inspiration to me. And as I said, to have a charity first where you've gone from watching me speak to speaking to running your own events and uh, kick it ass is quite incredible. And, I mean, if if that is anything, if that's the only thing that people take away from tonight, please, <laughs> that's enough to know that you can be at absolute rock bottom and, and come from where you've come through uh, to be where you're at right now. And 
unfortunately you're not at Mindful Oz, but you are kicking ass. <laughs> what is the new gig? Tell us all about the new gig. Um, yeah, wow. Um, well, I actually, would you believe, um, the way that I got this new gig was through um, through a connection, through a, a loss of a, um, a family friend's son. Um, so one of our friends and Matt, you've you've helped them along the way, um, Louise and Cam, shout out to them. Um, they unfortunately lost their son to suicide. He was having um, a number of um, a number of demons. He had a number of demons that he just unfortunately really struggled to battle with. Um, he, like you, didn't have a very good experience when it came to professional help, um, and ultimately um, that saw the end to his life. So um, that um, brought that tragedy brought me really, really closely together with Cam and Lou, um, Lou especially, just helping her to try and understand um, from the other side what he may have been feeling, um, what he may have been going through. You know, at the end of the day, I wasn't Nathan. I didn't know Nathan personally. Um, I only have the memory of him, um, which is a beautiful memory, but I didn't know him. So I can't begin to um, completely understand what he was going through and why he decided that morning to to take his own life but i have been there like you said i have been at that at that place and and made that decision made that made that conscious decision to try and take my life so i can from that perspective understand what that's like and how how one comes to make that decision mm. um so that was a really beautiful albeit um very tragic and traumatic connection that i made um and through that i became more um I suppose, invested in their lives um, and connected with them um, and was actually just at their business trying to help out Daniel, my husband's business, um, and ended up asking them if they they wanted anyone to be working for them. Um, yeah, they had an opportunity. They had a hole in their business that they needed to fill um, and my skills and expertise in construction happened to fill that hole. So I've been there for all of a month now um, and it's the most supportive and most beautiful workplace. It's hard gig. It's just definitely the hardest gig I've ever had, um, but it's the most rewarding um, and it's it's a really beautiful challenge. So I'm very, that. very grateful for it. I love yeah. that. And they are very, very beautiful people. But I dare say that the added element of knowing what you know, Jamie, and being able to provide that working place with the support that you do for so many people would have been a contributing factor but yep. no one has the understanding of what you've experienced without going through the things that you've gone through do you want to talk us through this very start of your journey and how young were you when you started to realize and find and feel these thoughts and and ideations that you're experiencing because i believe it happened at a very young age yeah it did yeah um so I suppose I've always um, always been a pretty sensitive kid, um, always taken things to heart um, and definitely worn my heart on my sleeve, um, which I don't necessarily see as a bad thing, but unfortunately sometimes it um, it made my, um, uh, yeah, it just made me a little bit vulnerable, I suppose. But um, the moment, and I can still remember it to this day, I was standing in the living room of our house. We moved around a lot because um, my dad was uh, very heavily invested into property. Um, so we used to build houses, live in them and then sell them. Um, and we were renting at one point waiting for a house to be built. And I would have been about 12 or 13 at the time. And I was standing in the living room and it was um, over a fight, something ridiculous that I'd fought with my sister and gotten in trouble with my mum. And I remember physically being so angry and pushing the emotion down. I could, I still can physically remember it, pushing that emotion down and just thinking to myself, one day I am going to explode. And at that point, I knew that I thought differently to other people. Um, and within, you know, within that same year at 12, 13, um, I had written my first suicide note. Um, I was in year seven um, and I still remember writing it. It was in a pink diary um, and I remember writing how I was going to do it, why I was going to do it, writing down, you know, that my family, it wasn't their fault um but that was my way of coping i didn't know how to deal with the uh build up of emotion 
that was inside of me because I had learnt um, at a very, very young age um, that expressing outward and outwardly and negative emotions um, was not necessarily a good thing. And that's got nothing to do um, negatively with my parents. Um, you know, that just my, my sister would have angry outbursts and she would get in trouble for it. So I modelled off that behaviour. Um, and in through my studies in root cause therapy, I've learned that and, and reflection in knowing you, I've learned that um, that was the turning point for me learning very quickly and modeling very quickly that negative outbursts um, equals getting into trouble um, caused me to push my emotions down for a really, really long time. I was always the good girl. I was easy to deal with. That's what my mum always said. You know, I never got in trouble at school. I never, I was 13 years of schooling, not one detention. I wish I could say the same thing. <laughs> full-blown nerd, straight-A student, not one detention. Um, you know, I was I was a good girl. I was a classic, classic good girl. And um, unfortunately, I, I wore that too well. Um, and all of those heavy, dark, negative emotions just built up over time. And it didn't take very long for them to manifest into something um, pretty dark and terrifying, especially that young. And probably the case for a lot of people that are listening that have those younger people in their lives. I mean, a lot of parents online, a lot of people that follow the Mindful Oz work and they'd be watching this or watching it at a later date and understanding that they've probably got kids 12 years old, year seven, the same way you were going through these yeah. and experiencing those uh, thoughts um, or ideation. How did you combat those thoughts and how did you, I mean, you're starting to, to realise what these thoughts are and to make sense of them. And I know we talked about root cause therapy, but that's a long mm. way down the track. Absolutely. How did, you, how did you first combat these thoughts and how did you know what to do at that age? Uh, I didn't. I didn't have the tools or, or the knowledge um, to be able to deal with them. Um, I began stabbing my wrists and legs with a compass just to get some sort of feeling because I was feeling everything but nothing at the same time. Um, I was pretty heavily into sport, um, so that seemed to help, although I didn't knowingly use it as a coping mechanism at the time. Um, I didn't feel comfortable to talk to anyone about it. Um, so I suppose at the time my outlet was writing in my journal um, all of these negative dark emotions, um, crying a lot um, in the comfort of my bed and, yeah, and self-harm. Mm. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is the way when we're that young, we don't, as you said in your first sentence, the, you didn't really know how to deal with it and, and to combat those thoughts and feelings at that age and that's why we're no. in the primary schools uh, working with kids as young as three and four years old to teach them how to identify, control and express their thoughts and feelings and, I know that you're a yeah. big fan of that program and, and the work that we are doing along with many others in the country. Yeah, I am. I'm really, um, I'm a massive advocate for that because I just didn't have those tools to be able to learn and recognise and, and safely express my emotions. Um, and my parents didn't have the tools either. And that's, you know, that's no fault to them. Mm. They just didn't have those tools because, you know, they'd, they'd never had really any issues um, growing up. There was no you know, there was no real history of mental illness in my family. There was no um, severe issues in my family. We had no um, significant trauma or anything like that. So I was really the first one that they were um, that they were experiencing that kind of that was experiencing that kind of pain and that kind of um, mental anguish. So mm. you know, and they didn't even know they they didn't know because I didn't talk to them because I didn't feel comfortable because I didn't know. I didn't know how to express those emotions. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'm such a huge advocate for your um, your school program, Mindful as a School Program, because I think it's so important as young and as early as possible um, to be able to teach kids to know how to express those emotions in a safe and productive way. Yeah, absolutely. We don't need to be talking about mental health or suicide with them that young. I no. mean, I'd be happy too. I think that they yeah. should be able to learn what those things are as, as absolutely. young as we can so that we can combat them and not wait until they combat us. Mm. However, if we can get into primary schools as young as, you know, kindergartens, three, four, five, and start building the emotional resilience by talking about our five core emotions, to talk about what kindness is, to talk about gratitude. I mean, 
these kids will have the solutions before they get to the point of 12 mm. years old and the same uh, devastation that you faced. And um, the same age, 12 years old, was the first uh, time I lost someone to suicide close to me. So yeah, so very relevant that we get these primary school programs through the door and, and get people the help and support or to feel safe um, in talking about these things. So Absolutely. Um, the next chapter for you starts to get a little bit interesting. Uh, you mentioned that you love exercise and you were quite the netballer from all reports. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get to see it, so I can't. But from all reports, you're quite the netballer and you played at high levels. You mentioned that exercise was uh, a way in which to combat your thoughts and a way to keep yourself well, and I know it's a big part of what you do. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk to us a little bit more about, unfortunately, the netball situation and what happened for you? <laughs> Yes, well, um, I actually, <laughs> I surprised myself in actually being good at netball um, because I was and still am a very gangly, awkward person. Um, I have very long limbs and um, not very much uh, spatial awareness or hand-eye coordination. Um, so when I started getting good at netball, um, had a good coach and a good team behind me, um, and that all comes back to, you know, a good support system. You can't, you can only be as good as your team. Um, but that was my outlet. Running and netball were my outlet. So growing up and going through, you know, as, um, as I said before, going through those emotions at 12 years old, I hadn't hit puberty at that stage. Um, I went through puberty a little bit later. So I was dealing with those thoughts, feelings and emotions then and then gone through puberty, which only exacerbated every single thought, feeling and emotion that I had and made me, you know, even more um, overwhelmed um, and unable to to deal with those emotions. So for me, it, it turned to, um, I suppose you could call it a, a healthy outlet. Um, I moved away from self-harm at that point. Um, I certainly went back to it later on. But um, at that time, I, I used my outlet and all my energy went into sports. So I was playing basketball, was never any good at basketball. There's too much for me, bouncing a ball and trying to run at the same time. Um, netball was my netball was my thing. Netball was my jam and running. Um, we lived in um, on the Liddell Lake. My parents still lived there. Um, so running around the Liddell Lake a couple of laps every day after school and netball training a few times a week um, really started to help me deal with um, Let's not say deal with, I'm just going to say keep a lid on my emotions. Um, I definitely didn't deal with them. I just pushed them away and the endorphins um, and the, the I suppose I'm going to call it mindfulness, although I didn't recognise it at, as that at the time. When I was playing sport, all I was thinking about was the next move, the, the second move ahead, how I could stop that goal, how I could make that pass. I was never thinking about anything else but the court um, and my teammates on it and how I could defend um, the opposition. So, um, yeah, th that combined with the endorphins you get while you're, while you're exercising like that, um, that really kept a lid on um, all of the emotions that seemed to be tumbling over the edge at that point in my life. So, yeah, that happened and then um, that managed to get me through year 12, which is a really tough year. Um, I don't cope very well with um, with added stress, still don't. So, you know, the the coronavirus situation, I'm feeling more overwhelmed than, than most and not coping as well as most people, I suppose, can, although, you know, a lot of people are really struggling with it. But I seem to break down in these kind of situations, um, but at least now I have the tools to recognise that and deal with it accordingly. Um, anyway, at the time um, I went through Year 12, that really helped me. Netball really helped me to get through it. Um, and then first year of uni, um, I was playing a Saturday game and tripped over and snapped the ligaments in my ankle. Um I went to the hospital and then they told me that I would be back within a couple of weeks. However, unfortunately, um, I had actually snapped the ligament. So they told me it was a, a grade one, grade eight tear or whatever, um, and that I'd be back really soon. And no, it was a completely snapped off the bone ligament um, that required surgery. So I saw a doctor, I saw a physio, the physio referred me straight to a surgeon and the surgeon put me straight in an MRI and said, no, you, we, 
it's snapped so far that we actually can't find it on the MRI. They had to go and find it through surgery. So it was actually, yeah, it snapped so far back that it was up into my leg. Um, so that was fun. So a few weeks or a couple of months in a boot. Um, and then within, you know, call it three months, I was back training again. I'd started lightly running. Um, and then another month had gone by and I was on a uni camp and tripped in a hole in broad daylight and snapped the ligament in half. So that was me done. Um, I just started uni for my second year, so I couldn't uh, go and get surgery again because I went to uni down in Frankston and was living in the Lidl. I, it's really hard to get there by public transport, so I had to wait um, until uni semester was over, which is about 12, 13 weeks. Um, so I dealt with a snapped ligament for three months <laughs> and just, yeah, had to just stop playing sport, um, stop running. Um, and that's, you know, that, that was the time where, where my mental health really took a downturn. Um, mm. the first surgery I really did struggle. Um, but I, tried to motivate myself as best as possible. Um, but the second surgery, that was what really hit me hard. It was, you know, four months since my previous surgery. Um, I had so much ahead of me netball wise. I had so much ahead of me uni wise. Um, and it just completely caught me off guard yeah. um, and completely stopped me dead in my tracks. And my mental health, uh, took a really, really hard downturn. Can I ask something there, Jamie? You, you've mentioned we've mentioned how um, how much exercise, how good exercise is for us, and there will be a lot of people that are watching that are doing the same thing. We eat mm -hmm. well, we try and get as much sleep as we can, and we're making sure we're exercising. And it's about as far as our self care goes. Yep. Was there anything else in that time that you were doing, or is that all you were doing? Um, so I, in that time, I had officially been um, diagnosed as um, with depression and anxiety. Um, so I was also trying out psychologists um, and also had been put on medication. Um, that's as far as I thought it needed to go, to mm. be honest. I didn't yeah. have the yeah, understanding. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't have the understanding and I didn't have um, the... I didn't have a brain like yours to go, okay, what else is there out there? I just accepted it and I just was told, I accepted what the what the psychologist told me. I accepted what the doctor who diagnosed me told me. Um, I accepted the medication and that's all I thought that there was. No, 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 no. it's not to compete. Uh, the reason I say it is because I was exactly the same. Mm. We both got to the point where we believed that the only thing that existed to us was therapy and medication, yeah. exercise, nutrition and sleep. That's all the world knows. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I wanted to bring this up and the way that I've led this is is to exactly to show people at home that are struggling right now, if that are they them three things are the only three things you're doing, please reach out. We will arm you with more than that because that there is not full protection. If you get injured, what else you got? And and yeah. for you, Amy, that was a big part of your journey was uh, hitting the troughs of of depression and the lows of ideation because once that that one thing that kept you well in exercise had been taken away from you, you know, playing yeah. or in a social environment with your friends, it's taken away from you. What have you got? And I was the same. I bathed in that shit for eight, eight years and thought yeah. therapy's not for me. Medication's not for me. Exercise is gone. Cause I'm injured. I'll just give up. And I just want yeah. people out there to understand just what exists to us. But let's yeah. touch back on now that I've, I've made that point. <laughs> I just want to touch back on, you mentioned something that's good because a lot of people understand my journey. I didn't get the help and support of professionals that I would have liked. That is no detriment to them. That's just who I am and that's my journey. That is my mm. journey, I repeat. However, Jamie, you have got a success story in a psychologist. Please share that because I want people to understand my path is different to your path and I'm so glad that there is fantastic professionals out there that have given yeah. you the support that you've needed. Yeah, absolutely. And we were just talking about this before because um, I literally just had an appointment with her at five o'clock. So um, I, I want to preface it by saying it wasn't, she wasn't the first one I went to. 
Um, I had well on given up um, before I met her. Um, I She was about my sixth or seventh psychologist, I think, and in the meantime I had been on medication, stopped medication, been back on. Um, I saw some real interesting characters um, that called themselves psychologists. Um, I told my story at that point there was, you know, there was no suicide or anything like that, but there was certainly emotions, um, built up emotions behind it. I told that part of my story to one psychologist and she cried um, and I couldn't console her. So I was very taken back. Um, you know, I had to tell my story over and over and over again. And at this point, I wasn't even really sure what I was going through. Like I couldn't even really put words on it. Um, you know, I'd only just really in the previous year um, been told or been labelled as you have anxiety and depression. So there was only just in the last, you know, in the 12 months prior um, an explanation as to why I was feeling that way because I just thought it was, oh, everybody feels like this, everybody wants to die. Um but I finally realised when I started, you know, trying to speak up a little bit that that wasn't normal and that wasn't okay. Um, so, yeah, I just really want to preface it by saying that you, I didn't give up um, and I had hope because my parents supported me through that. Mm. So, um, you know, anyone who is experiencing, and I'm sure that nine times out of ten people will have a, a, a negative experience when it comes to psychologists. And I've spoken to so many people um, that have said psychologists don't work for me. And I was of the same opinion, and I know you are too, Matt, but you've tried over 20. Um, most people try one or two um, and they give up. So you, like me, um, were very determined to, to give it a really red hot go. So um, I tried psychologist after psychologist and was trying medications at the same time. Um, and it just got to a point where... It was all too hard after about the sixth or seventh one and um, my mum just said, oh, my mum goes, she loves walking. So she walks around um, everywhere <laughs> um, and had walked through through the backs of Lilydale um, and had walked up through the hills and found just this little sign, um, Dr Nicola Ashman, shout out to her. Um, so she just had a tiny little sign um, in a beautiful, I think it's like half an acre home, um, right in the middle of the bush in Lilydale, beautiful trees everywhere. Um, it's just gorgeous. So anyway, she went and she spoke to spoke to her and um, mum said, I just, I really need you to meet her. And it, it was a bit of a fight between us because um, I was just, I'd given up by that point. I really had, but I was also had started to open up and try and gain that support network and my parents were really supportive even though they didn't understand um they were always really they were always really supportive in the sense of trying to trying to understand and trying to walk a day in my shoes so um they just said please don't give up on us um can you please just go and see her once just once that's all you have to do um so I went and saw her um and that, that was nearly 10 years ago so you know, I definitely, um, Nicola and I have been through ups and downs together. Um, but, and as I said to you before, I always, always, always feel better for seeing her. Always. There's not, not one session have I ever come out of it being like, that was a waste of my time and money. So um, there's been a lot of times where I've near on cancelled because I don't want to go because I don't want to talk about how I'm feeling um, or I don't, you know, I couldn't be bothered or, you know, I push it away. Um, but she just brings me back to, to my core principles. She um, brings me back to the now. She makes me understand and helps me understand um you know, all that I've gone through and all that I've experienced and, and your intro was a really good reminder of everything that I've achieved because I really forget that sometimes and I'm I sure do. you're the same sometimes. You just, you forget all of the good that you've done and all of the all of the things that you've achieved and all of the things you've overcome too. Can I ask um, a question on the back of that, Jamie? Yeah, of course. If I had to write a list right now and ask you all of your achievements prior to being diagnosed and all your achievements after being diagnosed, which one would be greater? After, for sure. There you go. For everyone listening, please, 
It's there's nothing wrong with being diagnosed. There's nothing wrong with having minor behavioral health choices. It's not a choice. Um, but as the sooner you have build that acceptance to to know that uh, that's what you've got, and guess what? It's not going anywhere, and neither are you. Um, so create that magic out of what you've got and the person that you are, because the sooner that we deal with our emotions and uh, build, start to build that resilience, we can go on to create many, many beautiful things. And you've done exactly that, um, Jamie, and you only have to yeah. listen back on the intro to see all the things you've done. You know, I just want to touch on something you've, you've mentioned about supportive people around you and, and your psychologist is a beauty for that. Your parents are a beauty for that. Your partner's a beauty for that. What are the things that you need to see from the people that love you the most to know and feel supported? Um, just a presence. That's, what does that look like? For me, that's all it is. It's um, just reaching out um, for me and I'm sure like you. Um, I, I've always had the um, always had people say to me, oh, well, my door's always open. Um, that's all well and good, but I'm not willing to walk through it. Correct. Um, that that's the hardest thing, and that's what people really don't understand. I think when it comes to um, those with mental illness and those, those with um, with brain pain, is that that they 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 think that those kind of people are willing to reach out. They're wanting to ask for help. Their ask uh, their cries for help might be very different to "Can you please help me?" It might be cutting of the wrists. It might be a suicide attempt. It might be yelling and screaming and trying to pick a fight um they're all cries for help and you know the 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 attention seeking thing and this is something that nicola um has taught me and and i still think of it she probably told me it uh, a good six or seven years ago um she said you are attention seeking you know the, the cutting of the wrists and the and the suicide attempt and the at the picking of fights that is attention seeking but not in a negative way you are trying to ask for help but you just don't have the words for it um for me i i've had to learn that the hard way um and through nicola and through you um and through mindful oz have learned to speak up and speak out and go okay my support network I need you to ask me how I am. I need you to ask me if I need help because I don't know how to ask for it sometimes. And still to this day, if I'm struggling, I still automatically react or revert to push people away. I'll just get through it. I'll just deal with it. I'll push through. But that's not the way that we should be dealing with it and that's not the way I want to. And then I get upset and feel disconnected that people aren't reaching out. Um, yeah. So for me, and, and it's something that I'm always mindful of, if I know a friend of mine is struggling or if I know that um, someone has a behavioural change, um, I will reach out. And, and that's what I've always asked my support network to do since, um, since learning that that is what I need to do. I've said, can you please just check in with me? So every day, um, regardless of where he is or what he's doing, Daniel will check in with me. My family constantly checks in with me. Um, I've got friends who reach out to me um, constantly throughout the week um, just to check in, even if it's just a message to say, hey, I'm here. Hey, I love you. Hey, you're supported. Um, the door's always open. So, yeah, that's that's probably the biggest thing for me um, is it's all well and good for people to say, oh, well, I would have reached out to them. I was there for them. It's too late if they've lost their lives. It's it's too, it's too late if they're feeling that way. Even if they are still alive, reach out to those people because they cannot reach out for themselves. Yeah, let's do a little exercise, Jamie. You're familiar with this one. I don't know how this is going to go because I can't see no one. <laughs> <laughs> sitting and watching at home and what do we got we got 56 people online i don't know who you're around i don't know who's in your house but let's try something and i won't know if it works because i can't see you but <laughs> raise your hand wherever you're sitting right now if you care about the people that are sitting next to you or that are under your roof everyone put a little hand emoji oh i love that Love that was that. sneaky. Now, that. keep that hand raised if you've told them, poop, them people or that person in your house today how much in love you love and care about them. And I no doubt at all that some hands would have gone down. The difference between how much we say we care and how much we show it is the difference that this world aches for. 
So please, please, as Jamie says, as I'll continue to say, yeah, the hands are going up. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, as I continue to say, it's don't get to the place that I've got to. Don't get to the place where Jamie's got to before we start showing people how much we truly care about the people around us. Don't take people for granted. Don't say that there was no signs, that I've never seen it coming, that I didn't think that they would do it because that's ignorance. It is ignorance. And I get worked up talking about it because it is. There's always signs. There's always symptoms if you're looking hard enough and asking the right questions. Yeah. When you're providing the right, right space for people to feel supported, they will tell you how much they, they, they're struggling. Every yeah. single day, Jamie reaches out to me and asks me how I'm doing. Why am I able to tell her how I'm doing with all, with all authenticity and honesty? It's because she provides a safe, supported environment for me to do so. It's not rocket science. We are so expectant of people sitting at home right now to scream from the rafters that they're unwell and to come to us. Come, come speak to me. My door's always open and the kettle's always on. I shared a Facebook status. I care about mental health. No. Fuck your kettle. Fuck your door being locked. Go and check in on the people that are unwell instead of making them come to you. I'm sick of seeing it. I am really sick of seeing it. We're so well, yet we're expecting the people that are unwell to come to us. I just can't harp it anymore. It makes me sick. When I, I say it again. I think I've already said it on one of the episodes. Dr. Bart Andrews, um, one of the best in the field of suicide prevention, says all the time, and it's one of my favourite quotes, when we see a community, when we see a lot of uh, mental illness being expressed in the community, it's a sign the community is sick, not the person itself. Yeah. We didn't choose the minor behavioural health issues. Jamie didn't choose to have minor behavioural health challenges. It's up to us as the people that are well, that are people that are sitting here watching this tonight to make sure that we're always reaching out and always showing the people close to us how much we love and care about them because you don't want to get down the path of me and wish you could have those opportunities again tonight with the people that you've lost. So please, please listen to what Jamie's saying. Yeah. I just want to touch on why I'm looking at all the hands go up. Thank you so much for everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I have no one in my house but didn't tell myself that. <laughs> There you go. There. No, do I, Beck. I don't Tomorrow, have anyone in my set house yourself either. a challenge today, right now. I want you to start telling yourself how much you love yourself. I want yeah. to tell I want you to start telling yourself how much you appreciate the person you are. It's so important we speak the same way we do so freely to everyone else out in the world with kindness, compassion, that we do it to ourselves as well. The same way you do, Jamie. I know you put practice into that now. Um, same as many other people that are looking after their wellness, um, just like Jamie is. Keep the questions coming in. If we can get some questions in for Jamie, please. I'm loving the interaction and engagement tonight um, and love seeing all the hands raised. You're absolute legends. Um, awesome. Jamie, 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 the next chapter of your journey starts with the healing, which is my favourite part. How did this all come about and how did you get to the place of wellness you're in? Walk us through it. Let's let we, I want to hear it. I want to hear how to be well. Okay. Well, um, I suppose... God, where do I start? Let's start at rock bottom, okay? Perfect. The solid um, foundation in which we rebuild our life is rock bottom. Go, Jamie, absolutely, go. Absolutely, absolutely. So you touched on in my um, in my beautiful intro um, that I did um, very nearly um, end my own life. Um, I, I had no regrets. The only regret that I had was that it didn't work. Um, that, that was my instant, um, when I woke up in the hospital, that was my instant thought. Um, I was, I remember telling the nurse that, you know, I only regret that I, that I failed. And that's what I thought. I thought I'd failed, um, which is not a good attitude to have. It's not the right language. And I certainly don't, um, through education and knowledge now, don't use a failed suicide attempt. Um, I had a suicide attempt. That just is what it is. Um, when I finally was put into um, the normal wards, um, I came to um, and I woke up with about probably about 12 people around me. Um, my parents were in Peru and completely uncontactable at the time. So they actually didn't find out what had happened for about 24 or 48 hours until after the fact. So it wasn't until I was home um, or at my um, auntie's house that ha they had found out. Um, but I woke up um, to my grandparents, my auntie and uncles and a few of my closest friends standing around my bed um, and the look 
of fear and guilt and grief on their faces, that's what changed my tune. And I still remember it to this day. And I had a conversation last year with my grandmother um, because I don't remember anything that I said. I don't remember a lot from that time. But my grandmother said, when I came to, when I finally woke up, all I said was, I didn't realise how many people loved me. Mm. That's what I said because I didn't know, Um, you know, and like we just touched on, um, I wasn't told, you know, I, I, I knew logically that I was loved and my parents always told me that they loved me and and my um, my family always told me that they loved me but I never at that time that I was at rock bottom I'd pushed everybody away I had isolated myself completely you know I wasn't really talking to many friends um, I didn't have deep relationships I was drinking a little bit. Um, I was in a pretty toxic relationship. Um, I was constantly fighting with my family, um, constantly trying to push them away, constantly starting fights. So I didn't emotionally realise how many people loved me. Jamie, pause so you when there. I, yeah. Pause you there. Go over to the comments. You can see the comments? Yes. I want you to see how many people love you. Have a quick squeeze. I want you to see how many people love you. We're in isolation. I know these times are tough and I know people are struggling. I want people to recognize how many people love the person that you are and I want you to see it right now. Thank you, everybody. That's beautiful. Soak that in for a second while I talk shit because I want you to know how much you're loved and appreciated because I bloody do and I love this conversation. I love having you on. Um, You're special to me and special to so many other people and I know that this is a continual struggle for you. I know that it's a continual fight. Mm. So I want you to understand how much we love and appreciate you and to know that this is the exact reason I wanted you to, to get you on so we could spread this love with everyone else as well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I love you all too. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, so that was a really big turning point for me, um, emotionally accepting that I was loved um, and that I did have something to live for. Um, it certainly wasn't all uphill from there. There was certainly, it's certainly been a roller coaster from that point. It's been nearly seven years now um, since that day. So, um, yeah, it's been a very interesting journey. Beck, I've seen a comment from you, what made me st- stop self-harming. I actually didn't, uh, didn't physically hurt myself from that day, from the day I left the hospital. Um but I continued to self-harm in the sense of um, binge eating, in the sense of excessive spending, in the sense of toxic relationships, um, in the sense of, you know, excessive alcohol consumption, all of that stuff, not not um, taking my health seriously. And honestly, it wasn't until uh, I met Matt and I came across Mindful Oz that I stopped really self-harming um in every sense of the word so i'll just um yeah preface that um and answer that question from beck um but basically from there um i realized that my mental health um or my mental illness was really serious i was in a really really dark place um and I really, really needed to get some help. So um, I was seeing Nicola at this point. Um, I had only been seeing her for a little while, maybe a year or so. Um, so I started seeing, and I was only really seeing her on about a three week to four week basis. So I now started seeing her it, for the first couple of weeks, it was twice a week. Um, I, and the other thing, the other big change that I made was I had a massive, massive influx of friends and family. So I had people checking in on me every day, every hour of every day. My um, auntie, shout out to Shazzy, bless her absolute beautiful soul. She forced me to sleep in a bed with her uh, for the first uh, few nights before my parents came home. They couldn't come home for about a week. So she forced me to sleep in the bed with her um, just so she knew I was safe. 
Uh, it certainly did absolutely nothing for my lack of sleep. She snores really loudly. So <laughs> <laughs> I definitely didn't get much sleep, not that I probably was going to get much anyway because, as you can imagine, and uh, as I'm sure you can empathise, Matt, um, your mind runs ragged um, yeah. those first couple of weeks after. So. Yeah, I think that's yeah. important to touch on, Jamie, just quickly for people that are listening. The times after we have someone attempt on their life, um, for me, for Jamie, I know you agree, they're the cup, they're the, they're the most, that's the hardest part is afterwards, that realisation that you are at the very rock bottom of life. And yeah. although there's only one way to go and that's up, that is the most difficult, difficult time to be, even more difficult than the time prior to the attempt. So please, for people out there that, are surrounded by that or have experienced that, please, that is the time most critical to that person is the absolute realisation that you're at the bottom of life. Um, and although, although there is only that one way to go and that's up, it is very, very, very bloody difficult to get up off rock bottom. Yeah. So please, sorry, Jamie. I just no, that's that okay. I think it's a really important um, point to touch on, Matt, because I, I think my life would have turned out a lot differently, um, if at all, if I didn't have that um, that beautiful um, a, and kind support and safe support network to fall back on in those first couple of weeks, really those first few months um, after after getting out of hospital. Um, I was checked in on um, and supported and, and made to feel safe every single minute of every single day. Um, I was constantly asked if I was okay. You know, it, it was um, a real uh, eye-opener for everybody in my family. Um, we hadn't really communicated it very well to the rest of my family, to my extended family. So it was obviously a real eye-opener for them um, to see how much I was struggling um, I, I made a really beautiful connection with my auntie and uncle um, that I stayed with because, um, you know, that they had um, experienced um, in their family uh, a similar thing um, outside of our immediate family. So um, their empathy and their love and their kindness really helped me get myself up, sit up and dust myself off. And then from there, being constantly supported with research, with information, with knowledge from my parents. I've never seen my mum go to work so hard um, on any of her, her projects um, than, than my mental health. Um, it was one of her biggest projects to date and it, it certainly saved my life. So um, for her to constantly be learning and trying to understand um, and researching what depression is, what anxiety is, what do I do with my daughter who's just tried to kill herself? How do I approach her? What do I talk to her about? And, you know, we, we still struggle sometimes um, in communicating, um, but we're a hell of a lot better than we used to be. Um, and that is obviously due to um, my learning of how to communicate but it's also due to her um her researching and her trying to constantly co constantly trying to understand what i'm going through and what i've been through so i think that's a really important point to note um lots of people um tend to shy away or back away when they've learned that someone has tried to attempt suicide um, they, you know, if they know that someone's tried to kill themselves, they will back away because they just don't know what to say. I'm telling you right now, even if you just text them to say, I'm here for you, that is enough. Yeah, because it's enough. one more text, it's one more person that they know that they can go to. Don't be the person that goes, I'm not going to text because they've already got heaps of people. If everybody does that, they've got no, or they feel like they've got no one. I hear that Reach every single day. Out reach out and I will always send a text even if I because I still think that sometimes oh well, you know that person's going through that but they have so many so many people looking out for them I preface the text and I say you know I'm sure you've got a hundred people looking out for you but here's one more my door's always open I'm here for you um yeah it's so important and um when you go through a traumatic experience like this, any any type of traumatic experience, whether it's cancer, whether it's a loss of a loved one, whether it's a suicide attempt, it doesn't matter. People either come towards you or they back away from you. Um, 
And I'm telling you now, if you know someone who is going through any type of trauma, but especially especially brain pain, because it is so isolating, reach out to them. No one ever, ever has enough people. You've always got so many, um, you know, the, the support network can never be too big, ever. Mm. There's nothing like all the eyes on you, but no love towards you. And that's mm. what I felt. Yeah. Everyone knew that the situations I've been in and people will continue to go, well, there's that guy and all eyes are on you. But how many of those eyes were converted into messages of love, support, um, hope and healing? So very good takeaway for people at home, Jamie. I want to move into the next part because I find this interesting and I've never questioned you about it. I want to know more. I bet the viewers do too. Um, we're going to fast track things a little bit. Center for Healing. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know it's a big part of your journey and you love it so much that now you want to be a practitioner in it and give it to more people, which yeah. is the person that you are. Uh, tell us how that all come about and uh, what it looked like and the benefits of it. Yeah, sure. Um, so it was something that I came across, again, thanks to Mindful Oz. Um, I... Uh, was connected with Ryan through um, through you, Matt, obviously, um, to actually be a participant on um, on Ryan's podcast, um, Shift Happens. So I went through um, that and I attended that and, and that was amazing. That was a really great experience. I'd never really done anything like that before, so I was very nervous. Um, but it was really cool to tell my story in that kind of platform um, and also to be able to listen back on it because, you know, when I um, tell my story um, in an audience like with Mindful Oz, you don't often get to the, the opportunity to look back and, and really reflect on what you've said. So that was a pretty cool experience. Um, but I had gone through, uh, this is only recently in the past three, two years, um, I had gone through a pretty bad issue at work um, with uh, a pretty unsupportive um, and negative manager. Um, I was dealing with that a lot um, and my mental health had taken a really big hit. Um, I wasn't very happy at work and I'd reverted back to my old ways in not reaching out um, and not... Um, talking about things. Um, I'm very grateful to my friends and family um, and parents who um, recognise that and who who told me to. You need to get more help. You need to. Um, what what else can we do? What else can we do? And I just had this call it a light bulb moment um, to say, well, you know, I I went on that podcast. Um, I'm doing all of these beautiful things. Um, that are helping me now to deal with the now, they keep coming up. I want to know why. I want to understand why. And I'd learned a little bit about um, Ryan's um, Ryan's Centre for Healing through being on the podcast and understanding what they do. And my mind just went there, you know. I, I'm like, okay, well, all of the traumas that I experienced as, as a child and as a, as a um, teenager what if what if I can start to to unpack that? Because as I said earlier, um, I just pushed things down, and I never dealt with them. I constantly just pushed my emotions down, um, and constantly, um, constantly pushed my negative emotions away, um, and I, I never really brought them back up. You know, I talked about my childhood a little bit and talked about the negative emotions when I was going through all of those psychologists, but I never really hashed it out. Um, and I was, I was so, you know how diligent I am, Matt. I was so diligent every single day with my wellness um, plan and, and my my mental health plan through Mindful Oz. Um, but I was constantly feeling triggered, and I just felt like. I, I could be doing more. What else is out there? And I know, Matt, you do the same. You are constantly um, striving to find what else is out there. And now you found breath work and ice baths and all of that kind of stuff. You're constantly trying to find for the next best thing. Once you learn um, that there are things out there that can help you outside of exercise, sleep and medication, you start to try and research everything that you possibly can. Um, so for you, it's breath work and med and um, 
breathwork and ice baths and that that really does help me too um but at the time I obviously didn't know about that and I've always been very interested in um spirituality um not necessarily religion but but spiritual teaching so I was very drawn to um yeah <laughs> um no, yeah connected to self is what I was trying to remember <laughs> yeah, I wasn't no. trying to be religious connected no, that's to okay. self. yeah connected to self. For you absolutely so i um so i reached out to ryan and i just i had a meeting with him to see what he could offer me um and he, the way he explained it and the way i had already connected with him um, on a personal level really really resonated with me everything that he explained to me made a lot of sense um and i just thought you know what i'm just going to give it a go there's no price that I can put on my mental health and I am always trying to find new ways to, to better myself um, like you are constantly, Matt, and that's a really big inspiration for me. So I thought, what else can I do? How can I further this? Um, so I gave it a go and I became a patient um, or, an, yeah, an outpatient um, through the program and did the root cause therapy as the patient. So it's a 12-week program um, and basically it's it, it's very um, it's very spiritual. Um, it's a, It was a very enlightening experience. I went through, I've call it, called it an, an existential crisis um, where I realised that my, um, my values and my behaviours did not align and that's something that you teach. And that's something that I learned from you, but I never really, um, I could never put my finger on what was wrong or what was not aligning for me. And that really helped me to realise that the spirituality um, was the biggest connection for me. That sense of purpose um, and that sense of belonging, that what I got from netball and from being in that community, that was my missing piece. Um, so Mindful Oz gave me that. Um, and then I extended on that through spirituality. So I went through that and it connected me to um, a kinesiologist who told me that my um, what I was doing was not necessarily my true path. So um, I think it was about six months ago or so, um, Ryan came out with, and Centre for Healing came out with, hey, you can actually be a practitioner. And I, it just came up on my newsfeed and I'm not on um, Facebook a lot, so I miss a lot of things. Um, but that that was at the top of my newsfeed. So I clicked on it. I, I spoke to Daniel about it um, and I just thought this is something that I have to do. Um, this this course being in that, in that program helped me um, significantly and, you know, it, it steered my my life in a different direction than I ever thought it would. So um, I'm I'm so grateful for that connection through Mindful Oz because it, it Mindful Oz changed my life and then this steered my life differently. Um, so yeah, I, I I did the course and um, you know now I'm now I'm doing my practice hours to become a root cause um, root cause therapist. I love that, and I think it's really important what you just said about Mindful Oz. You know, the, I never started this organization to encourage people to do things the way that I do them or to live the life that I live. We encourage people to find the tools and skill sets that match them best. Yeah. And if we don't know the answer to something, we outsource the answer, uh, the answer to someone. And I just, I'm trying to put a link up, but this thing's not working. I'll put it in the comments after. But Ryan and Melissa and the work they do at the Center for Healing is incredible. And it's no wonder that every single person that I've referred there has come out a hundred times better person than the one that walked in because one, they've put the time and effort into what they're doing, but the people at the Center for Healing have lived and breathed this stuff. Yeah, they're, they're qualified, but they have the element to know that they can understand what Jamie's talking about, to understand what Beck's daughter was going through because they've been there. And I just think that's a really critical uh, place to to work from and to, to bring the skill set from. So absolutely I, mean, I, just, I wanted to put the link up and, and big shout out to ryan who is still operating um from online processes now so i mean find his programs go and have a look at what he offers i mean he, he's just one of the best in the game i love what he does so i love that we could talk about that uh jamie i want to yeah um, there's one question up above and i really think that that's the most important part of what we're talking about today and i just want to go back to it and it was from casey mm-hmm 
Jamie, how are you going now and coping with all your stresses? Yeah, it's a um, shout out to Kate, one of my close friends. Um, but that's something that we haven't really talked about before. So that's interesting. Um, sometimes I don't. Um, you know, stresses that come out of nowhere, like COVID-19, for example, um, they hit me for a six still. I still, you know, if, if I am hit with a significant adversity, um, I recently lost um, an old friend. She um, lost her battle with cancer. She was only 28 years old. Um, and that was the week of my wedding. Um, so that was a really, really big hit to me. Um, we weren't close um, anymore, but she was my best friend for over three years. So um, things like that, things like COVID-19, um, they still really hit me for six. Um, but I am proactive. Every day I do something for my mental health. Every single day I do something to try and better myself. Um, I don't wait until something happens to deal with it. I am proactive in trying to um, manage and be resilient. So, you know, I, I talk about... Um, I talk about things. Um, I talk about if I'm having a good day. I talk about if I'm having a bad day. Um, I write shit down. Um, I'm not. I'm not super big on the reflection thing. Although I, with writing things down, I mean, I reflect constantly um, on um, conversations I have with you, Matt. On conversations that I have with my psychologist. Um, on situations that have come up that have triggered me. Um, I reflect in my own head as to why that has triggered me, um, how I could um, deal with it differently next time. Um, you know, if I get to a point where I can't get out of my own head, I get a pen, I get a piece of paper and I start writing. I don't know what I'm writing half the time, but I just start writing things down and eventually it will flow and eventually it will start to come up. I leave it for a minute maybe a day, maybe a few hours, and then I go back to it and I reflect on it that way. Um, I take my dog for a walk every single morning. Um, exercise, whilst it's not the only thing, it is still a really big part of my wellness routine. Um, it's something that I have fallen off the bandwagon recently, um, but I'm constantly striving, even if it's going for a walk. I force myself to be outside of the house. Um, I connect with friends and family. Um, I do a lot of research. Um, I study constantly. I'm constantly trying to understand my illness as best as possible um, because I think that is really important to, to know how to, to combat um, the triggers and, and to cope with the stresses. Um, I practice mindfulness every single day. So I meditate um, I try and do yoga, but I'm not very good at it, Matt, as I'm sure you um, have seen before in the past. <laughs> um, I'm not good either. No, we're, we're not very good, but we do give it a red hot go. That's what it's about. Um, absolutely. You can only try, hey? Um, but but a big thing for me is mindfulness and meditation. So if if I'm if I'm finding that um, in the moment that I am really struggling with a, uh, with a thought or an emotion and I can't get it out of my head, I'll sit with it for a moment and I'll kind of delve into it but not not feed into it. So um, I think they're two very significantly different words. So I'll delve into it in the fact that I'll, I'll recognise it and I'll look at it and I'll try and understand, okay, why am I feeling this way? What does this mean? Um, not, oh, my God, I feel this way. Oh, my God, I'm such an idiot because I should be happy and I should be well and I'm promoting all of this mental wellness and, um, you know, I, I'm still sick and I'm still this and I'm still that. No, I'm not feeding into it like that. I'm not going to exacerbate the feeling and feed into it and manifest it. I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to non-judgmentally recognise the thought. Where is it coming from? Is there a trigger? If I can't figure out the trigger right now and I can't get it out of my head, can I change it? Can I do anything about it right now? Um, and that's a big thing that you've told me, Matt, is can you accept it? Can you change it? Or can you just let it go? Or create magic with it. Absolutely. So um, I think they're, they're really big things is 
proactive nature. Um, so still every single morning, even now I'm in my own house and no one gives one shit as to whether I make my bed or not, I make my bed every single morning. Shout out to my mum for forcing that into me and shout out to you, Matt, for ingraining it into me. Um, but I make my bed every morning and that is that is huge for me because it starts my day off proactively. I It's my first action. As soon as I get out of bed, I make it and then I go about my day. Yeah. Um, the second thing that I do is I take a big glass of cold water. I've recently added that in. Um, so I know, Matt, you like to take cold showers. I'm still trying to get into that, still sometimes quite difficult, especially in those colder months. Um, but I do I do down a massive glass of cold water and it really um, invigorates me and I do it really mindfully as well. Um, so I sit with it. Put it on your head. I sit, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> um, I sit with it. I recognise the taste. I recognise how it feels going down my throat. I recognise how the glass feels. I just register and I sit with that. And it Doing really it. helps me set it up, set my morning up. And then the next thing I do is I take my dog for a walk. They are my three things in the morning. And then once I get back, I have a shower. I try and make it as cold as possible. You'll be very proud of me, Matt. Um, and then I sit and I do some meditation or Love I do it. something for myself in the morning, something that brings me peace and calm or something that brings me joy. And those four things in the morning, if I continue to do that every morning, um, and as I continue to do that every morning, it makes me be able to deal with um, the stresses that come up every single day. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Beck, as she said, and you're just talking to exactly what I've been saying for so long, Jamie, I'm loving this so much. Win the morning, win the day. The Absolutely. first 90 minutes of our day sets us up for an unbreakable day. Our first 90 minutes. There is so much science and evidence behind what we do the moment we wake up. And as Jamie said, when we're proactive and not reactive about what we do, when we get up of a morning, instead of looking at this stupid thing about all the people and trying to find our happiness in external things like other people and gratification off other people, likes, sh shares, follows, tags, Tinder matches, instead just put that bloody thing down, please, and be proactive about finding your happiness within you, not in other mm. people. And I can't stress that more. You might think that when Jamie was saying about making your bed, Michelle, I make your, make your bed. <laughs> um, when you might say that you know, when making your bed might be so trivial, but it's being proactive. And if you can set and do the first task of the morning and you can tick that on, then you can go off to do bigger ones. But if you can't have enough well-being to get up and do something as simple as that first, first thing in the morning, you're being reactive to the world and waiting for other things to happen for you to do them. Um, just, yeah, I can't speak more highly of what a morning does for me for a lot of other people around the world as i've always said the shit that i come up with does not come from up here for me i've researched and got this from some of the best advocates in the world the people that have been here done it and continue to live it every single day um so please take what you can away from what jamie does in the first um hour of the day and yeah same. absolutely yeah and just to your point matt um i i don't look at my phone either so i um that's something that's re I think really really important. Um, I trailed away from because I, I was very very diligent in not looking on my phone in the morning um, and not um, not feeding into my social media in the morning. And I strayed away from that recently. Um, and I'm finally getting back to just in the past probably three or four weeks, um, getting up and doing my proper routine that I just explained. And one of the most important parts is that. I leave my phone on my bedside table when I'm making my bed. I leave my phone on my bedside table when I'm going to get a drink. The only time that I pick up my phone and use my phone is um, when I'm trying to find a podcast to listen to, an educational or motivational podcast to listen to when I'm on my walk. Um, that's the only time I look at my phone and that, that takes me to like 8 o'clock in the morning. So, right. um, you know, and then if I feel the need to... Um, to look at my phone from there i will most of the time now particularly as i'm getting into this routine i don't feel the need to then go on social media and find that gratification because i've already found it within myself and i've already spoken to to my friends and family and i've texted you and i've texted my partner and i've texted you know my family or whatever to say hey have a good day hey i love you hey just checking in hope today hope you can ask today um i really try and make that um, my gratification, not external sources, like you said. So I think that's yeah. a really good point, Matt. I think it's so important. And as Mer Meredith says there, I'm not religious either, Meredith, each to their own, but I'm not religious. But the serenity prayer and 
and don't quit are two things I hang around the house to remind me struggles are worth fighting. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've got the serenity prayer here for everyone who's not familiar with it. Uh, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That, mm-hmm. that yeah. for me has been a big Huge. one for myself as well. I mean, to have the acceptance for your journey and to know what you can change and what you can't. There's so many things in life that are uncontrollable, death, finances, relationship breakdowns, fucking COVID-19. Like yeah. there's so many things right now that we can't control, but there's so many things we can. We have everything that happens in our household that are free to us, that we possess unlimited amounts of are the things that can keep us well. Breath work, mm. meditation, gratitude, empathy, kindness, compassion, support, love, and care. These things, exercise, all these things exist to us right here in our own four walls. And this is yeah. why the name of this this show is Confined by Walls, Not by Our Heart. We can continue to do these things every single day to become the best version of ourselves and to put the time into what really matters, and that's us and our mind and behavioral health. I just want to jump on, Jamie, to my my questions sure my questions dun, 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 dun. what else have we got here patty lawson hey patty um well that's not going to work for you because that question was for dennis armfield and it's who's your hardest opponent i've got the wrong bit of paper <laughs> <laughs> i don't have it. you are my hardest opponent Matt? Yeah, probably. I push you, I push you, I push you because look at the results. You're an absolute... Uh, you're a teammate, not an opponent. <laughs> That's it. All right, I've, all right, I'll make this up. I'll pretend I've got it written in front of me. Okay. The best teacher you've ever had on your mental health journey. Sorry, say that again. You cut out the best teacher. Best teacher you've ever had on your mental health journey. Is it a shameless plug if I say you? No, go go for someone else. I'm not a I teacher. I'm a dog. Honestly, no. Honestly, um. You have uh, called me out. You have made me see the truth. You have given me hard truths. You have Is there been else? honest. No, I'm going to do this to you now. You are my best mental health teacher. That and um, my mental illness itself. Ah, um, bingo. bingo, bingo, bingo. We are. Yeah. yeah. How much can we learn from the things that we experience if we stop and just? listen to them and what they're trying and, to teach yeah. us instead yeah, of I think, whinging and bitching and carrying on about all the things that are going wrong. What is it exactly. teaching us? I yeah. mean, Paula for me is a gift. I don't care who rolls their eyes back at me for saying that. Um, and I don't care if, if, I mean, I don't know if you share the same theory, but I just believe that if we stop and realize all the things that we've been through, we can't get nasty and angry and whinging and bitching at the things that have caused us pain if we're not willing to praise them for all the things that it's led us to, do, to be able to do. And we're both yeah. not in these chairs tonight. We both don't have the love and support of all the people here tonight if we hadn't been through the things that we have. So Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important. You know, you um, you and Mindful Oz helped me, um, helped me recognise that my mental illness was a gift, not a, um, not a burden. Um, but the, the second that I started speaking out and realising that not only were other people going through this too, but people were inspired by um, my journey and my experiences, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I, I spent so long thinking, why me? Um, and now it's that, that cliche saying of try me. Um, I am so grateful so grateful for everything that I've been through and I would not change it for the world. Nothing, not um, not the suicide attempt, not, you know, pushing my family away, not the, all the fights, all of the breakups, all of the tears, all of the heartache, all of the brain pain, all of the nights where I felt like I couldn't escape um, or that I needed to escape. Um all of the nights that I and the days that I spent so overwhelmed that I just genuinely did not know how to cope or what to do, I would not trade that for anything. And if someone told me that I was still going to live my life the way that I'm living it now um, for the rest of my life, pain and all, wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah. I'm so grateful because it's made me such a uh, empathetic um, and kind and understanding person um, and I've helped a lot of people um, mm. 
you know, even if it's just my friends and family, even if it's people that I don't know, but it's allowed me to connect with some pretty friggin' incredible people. Um, and I wouldn't have had the opportunities to meet the people that I have and share the stories that I have shared um, and listen to, to the experiences that I've listened to um, if I hadn't have gone through all those things. So yeah. you've guided me in that way. So call it you've been my my guide, um, but the, the, the teacher has been the mental illness. Love Absolutely. that, love that, love that. And, I mean, we talk about our pain. I, I was just saying to someone today, resilience. Resilience can't be built without trauma and pain. Absolutely. It has to come with a balance, and that balance is learning uh, what the growth and the learning is in that pain. That's how we become resilient is to put ourselves through stressful situations, to go through stressful situations, but to learn from them is building resilience. Mm -hmm. So to know that we can get through those tough times again and again and again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for everyone out there listening, we all go through shit. Don't tell me you don't. Every single person watching this right now, we all go through shit. But for some reason, I've said this time and time again, we pretend it's sexy to hide it. There ain't nothing sexy about not owning your shit. No. You own your pile of shit. Yeah? yeah. And you can deal with it and accept it and grow from it and learn from it. But the further more that you try and kick back off that pile of shit, that still exists. So own it. There's. I, I just wrote a note here tonight like, I'm, this thing's blowing up tonight and I'm really grateful for everyone engaging and I'm trying to keep up with it all. But, I mean, we've started a conversation tonight that will be seen by over 3,500 people. 160 people have engaged already and nine people have shared this conversation. Yeah, wow. Well, thank this you so much, When everybody. we own our pain, when we share yeah. a story, when we, when we actually step forward into the arena, get our hands dirty and talk about our shit. Yeah. I don't know the answer to this question. Only you will at home. Does anyone hate Jamie? because of she's, what she's been able to share with us tonight? And I'll answer for you as all, no. Do we love her more because she shared what she shared? Yes. There is no one in this planet, no one, that we can't love once they step forward and share their story with us. So please, mm. if you're sitting at home in silence, please, please, please step forward into that arena, get a little bit dirty and share your story with the world, and I promise you, you'll see the love and support that Jamie knows that she has mm. um, here tonight and every other day that she uh, gets the opportunity to wake up uh, and live on this beautiful, beautiful planet. Absolutely. Um, question. So we're going to run through these real quick. So these are just short, sharp. Okay. Provided I don't keep talking. Uh, <laughs> what gives you, the, what brings you the most joy? Oh, God, so many things. Um, the two biggest things that come to my mind are my crazy pup making ridiculous noises out there um, and my beautiful husband um, and yeah, my beautiful family. family. Those three things. Shout yeah. out to that beautiful man. Yeah. What does your place of well-being look like, Jamie? Uh, you're in it, actually. It's um, It's yeah, got sure. a beautiful – do you want me to show you around? <laughs> <laughs> now, I've got lots of beautiful lighting, as you can see behind me. I've got my salt lamp. Um, I, I'm really, as I said before, a really spiritual person. Um, lots of crystals, um, lots of beautiful um, – you know, little mementos that mean a lot to me. Um, some some gorgeous, um, a really gorgeous frame that my um, sister had made for me that talks about um, the Aquarian woman. Um, and two of my my biggest achievements is my my Reiki um, my Reiki certificates, which are behind me there. Um, so that's that's what it looks like. I um, have a little speaker that I play my um, my yoga um, tunes on or my meditation music on. I have that on all day, every day. So I actually work in here as well um, now that we're all in isolation. Um, so I do, do my nine to five in here um, and I have meditation music on all day. I don't have music that I can sing to because um, I get very easily distracted. Um, <laughs> so I have... Band a really yeah a really um nice somber calm tone um on all day and that really helps set the mood because it's the same music that i listen to when i meditate um so it really really helps me to f bring back uh bring myself back to the now uh, and recenter and reground myself um i've got yeah crystals everywhere essential oils everywhere it looks a little bit hippie but it's um it. a really beautiful and calm space and the second anybody steps in here they say this just feels beautiful yeah awesome it looks awesome yeah. favorite podcast or book 
Oh, that's a good one. I've actually just started listening to uh, Listen Able um, by Dylan Alcott. Have you listened oh, to that? No. He's a really uh, interesting and enlightening person to listen to. Um, so he, Dylan Alcott, the tennis player, um, so he's a Shout Paralympian. Out Shout out to Dylan. Um, I've been listening to his podcast. So he um, takes a really hard look at um, the stigma of disability, um, not only physical disabilities, but also mental disabilities, autism, all of that kind of stuff, and asks hard questions and tells raw truths um, about um, those living with, with a, a physical or mental disability. So um, I find that re very, very interesting because um, like mental illness, disability, I think, is very stigmatised. Um, so it's really opening my eyes up to um, to that world because I've never really experienced that. So that's a, that's a big one for me. Um, and then I, I listened to Ryan Hassan's podcast, Shift Happens, as well. Um, yeah, shout out to Ryan. A few shout outs on this. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. You thing. might have to um, to get some payment from him or something, another endorsement or something like that. No, uh, he um, paid me in providing love and support for a lot of good people yeah, through Mindful Life. Yes. Yeah, he has. Yeah, so th those are the kind of podcasts that I listen to and then I just search stuff. Um, yeah. I'm constantly trying to find stuff about the brain, brain health. Um, shout out to my mum's constantly sending me um, podcasts to listen to. Um, and then I also am really interested in um, just true crime, which I think everybody is. So, yeah, um, yeah like Australian true crime, case file, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Favourite quote? Favourite quote? Everyone just struggles with this straight up. Yeah, absolutely. Do you live by a man? Um, Do you have a favourite quote? Something you live by? Um, I'm just trying to think and now my mind's gone blank. That's all right. We'll come back. Okay. All right. Any superpower in the world, what would it be and why? Um, I would want to fly. Why? Um, to feel free. I've had the, the dreams that I have when I have a superpower, it's always flying. Nice. Um, so I, and, and the feeling that I get is that um, completely overwhelming sense of just being completely free um, nice. and not confined by anything else. Um, so, yeah, that's probably what I would do. Love that. Very insightful. It's a nice feeling Thank to be you. free. Thank you. Uh, we're three people, anyone in the world, dead or alive, to have dinner with and to meet. Who would they be? Oh, Brene Brown. Oh for yeah, sure. bam. For sure, number one. Um, I've already met him, um, thanks to you. But Kevin Hines, I'd love to have dinner with him and pick his brain. Um, and make that happen. That would be awesome. Thank you. Um, and Ellen. Ellen, great choice. Shout, yeah. out, shout out to Kevin Hines. He will be on this in a couple of episodes' time. Oh, amazing. Can't wait to see him on I ask him the same question. He says Jamie Wolf. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> uh, what's next for Jamie? What you got? Um, What's next? Well, I um, and since you didn't say it before because you couldn't pronounce it, um, I am slow, <laughs> slowly starting to build my business, Mayraki Mind. Um, Hold again, Mayraki Mind. There you go. Um, so, yeah, I'm basically the reason that I chose that um, that word is because um, the Greek meaning of it is to um, put something of yourself. Um, into something that you love. So it's to do something with soul, with purpose, with passion. Um, that's really important to me and that's something that you've taught me, Matt, and that I've learned along the journey um, is never do something if you're not going to do it with purpose and with soul. So um, I am now, you know, qualified in Reiki, um, which is spiritual and vibrational healing, um, and I'm furthering my studies in that come August. And I'm almost qualified in um, my root cause therapy training, which I'm then going to further on again in, in a more spiritual um, and deeper spiritual, um, I suppose, pathway. So um, that's what's next for me. Shit. Yes. 
Always. You helped me with my shit, so I can help you with yours. Return the favour, hey? <laughs> let's, let's, um, let's, let's let everyone know where to find your journey as it unfolds and how to watch Jamie as, I mean, she posts a lot of stuff that's very inspiring. So how do we find you, Jamie, and, and keep up with all the stuff that your business is going to be doing in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, my business is on Facebook. It's um, May Raki Mind. So M E R A K I Mind. Um, just on Facebook, I share it um, on my personal Facebook ch- page, which is just Jamie Munro, um, and then just on Instagram as well. So um, if you search um, Jamie, I think it's Jamie Lee Wolf, um, which is my maiden name, um, you'll find my Rocky Mind through there. So I'm probably tagged on a number of uh, Mindful Loss's Facebook pages so or Instagram posts, so you can find me through there too. I'm just going to throw up a couple of photos because I've been so engaged with this conversation we haven't been able to. Have a look at this beautiful family. Um, I think big shout, shout out, out to the whole crew. Family. We talked yeah. about the importance of having a family that's so supportive. There's one right there. Um, people should inspire to to love and care and to show up the same way that they do. And, and just a um, just a shout out um, to to my sister Kate. She's the one there on the left in the red. Um, by the way, she's wearing no makeup that night, so she is just a stunner. Anyway, um, she when when I. Um, and I think she'll be a little bit embarrassed me telling this story, but I think it's a really, really important story, um, just uh, one of acceptance. So um, when I first um, made an attempt in my own life, she didn't speak to me. She was so mad at me. She didn't understand. She didn't believe in depression, and yet she was the one who picked me off the, off the bathroom floor and took me to hospital. Um, she was dead against believing mental illness was a thing. Um, And now she's gotten to a point in her life where she has, over the time, she has researched, she has tried to understand, she has gone so far as to actually come with me to one of my psychology appointments and ask questions, why does Jamie feel this way? Is she broken? Can she be fixed? I don't understand what's going on. What does this mean? How can I help? Um, she's gone that far. So f- to go from being so mad at me that she wouldn't talk to me because she didn't believe in depression or anxiety or mental illness at all to understanding it to the point where on my hen's night, she, yes, we're all a bit drunk, but she told me how inspired she was by my journey and how um, amazing you know, she thinks that I am for going through what I've gone through and how much she can tr- she can understand now through her um, research and, and learning. I think that's just a really um, important message that, you know, if you're if you don't understand research, that's what all of my family did. No one got it. No one understood, but especially Katie. Um so I just wanted to shout out to her because I, I just really appreciate and love my family so much for, you know, it would have been really tough um, experiencing my um, my emotions and me not being able to deal with my emotions, but they all, you know, bit the bullet and they all really knuckled down to try and understand what I was going through and essentially that saved my life. Unbelievable. And essentially it's the same work that you're doing right now to save many more lives. So again, this is why I want to throw up the photos of the people that matter the most, because this is where we get our learning and this is how we grow. And what a beautiful example of some of a family that's just shown up and and been great supports. It's not only to Jamie, they've supported me, they've supported Mindful Oz. I mean, we can all be better people every single day. So I hope people take inspiration out of that. Now I've got one, I'm missing one guy and he's got to go up. Yeah, there's the fat. Ah, uh, the fat. <laughs> what a the photo. As I said, if, for anyone that's tuned in a little bit later, it's a three-year anniversary. Is that right tonight, Jamie? Three years, yeah, three years. spending together. it with me and not him. And I'm spending it with you. <laughs> Sorry, Dan, I love you, mate. But no, I'm just, I just wanted to highlight these things because it's it's really important, like what, what a great family can do and what a great family can help someone achieve. And you're going on to, to spread this message far and wide and, I know the team at Mindful Oz, from the board members to myself to the volunteers, we all love you, we all appreciate you, and I couldn't be more grateful for you to, for sharing uh, the night with us tonight and to share your story with so many people. Um, as I always say, favourite quote by Gandhi, if, you're too, if you think you're too small to have an impact on the world, go to bed with a mosquito in the room. This is a conversation of just two people tonight that wanted to come on and just share some stories with you from a lived experience um, one day they will deem us as professionals because we know we live it, we breathe it, and we do it every yeah. single day. And until that day, this, conti- this this country will continue to have its ups and downs. 
when they finally acknowledge people have lived experiences as professionals, we will see a lot of people get the help and support that they need and that they deserve. There's people out there that are aching. So shout out tonight to all the suicidal people who are alive strictly for the sake of others. I see you. You are important. You are loved. Thank you for being here despite your own feelings. I hope one day you want to be here just as much as everyone else wants you to. And the same way I found hope, healing, and recovery, I hope you do too. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. We're back tomorrow night at Thursday, uh, Thursday, 7 p.m. with Ben Higgs, who's another larger than life. Amazing, amazing Carmen from head to toe in tats, lives in Maruba in New South Wales, is an absolute jet, and I can't wait to share the journey with you tomorrow night. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We've touched you, and reached a lot of people tonight, and I just couldn't be more grateful for everyone tuning in. Uh, in a time of isolation where it's bloody hard, it's difficult, um, there's triggering, it's traumatic, a lot of unknowns. It's nice every two nights a week to come and join everyone on here and get some uh, connection back, whether that's via face with Jamie or via the comments in uh, yeah. the section just to the side. So be kind, remain positive and keep being gentle with the people around you. Reach in, don't wait for them to reach out. I love you all. Um, you're loved and worthwhile. Good night. <laughs>